Larry, please come up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zach. It's good to be back here. I preached at La Travesia years ago. I was just here a few weeks ago worshiping with you all with my daughter. We were on a surfing safari. We out, went out to Rincon and surfed for a few days. But it's good to be back here on something like official business, which I will be explaining at the end of the service. Um, but I am now pastor of Florida Coast Church in Pompano Beach, Florida. And so if you're ever there on the Lord's Day, look us up. We'd love to have you there. I feel somewhat at home. I was pastor of a church in Guadalajara, Mexico, that had uh, principally a Spanish-speaking work, but also an English-speaking congregation as well. So we had something uh, of a similar setup uh, for the 20 years we were in Guadalajara. We are looking at, a, as Zach said, a fairly long passage. It's in John chapter 6. I'd ask you to stand to hear the reading of God's Word this morning. And you will notice that this hangs together, and it also hangs together with what we saw, or you all saw, at the beginning uh, where Jesus multiplied the food for the, the multitudes. Hear the word of the Lord, John chapter 6, verses 22, all the way to 71. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So... The Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue 
as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. You may be seated. Let's pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For tens of thousands of years, many civilizations have survived and thrived on one of the first man-made foods. That's when humans discovered that they could take different types of grain and beat them up and combine them with other things and turn them into bread. And there are all sorts of kinds of bread around the world. There's pasta, which is sort of a kind of bread. There's flat bread. There are tortillas. There's a pita bread. There are all sorts of kind of breads around the world. And the world has really survived on bread. It has nourished us. Up until sort of recently, with uh, the discovery of gluten and some of its effects on some people, and with low-carb diets, and now bread has become for some the enemy. And if for you bread is the enemy, then uh, you need to go back a few years and realize that that bread is really the the mega metaphor of this text, and it's a a positive metaphor. It is that which sustains life. So let's get a a scope of this whole chapter. You, You already heard the first part of this chapter where Jesus gives bread. He multiplies bread for the people, and he he feeds them, he sustains them, and they're thrilled with this idea. And then there is this interesting interlude where he walks on the water, and that walking on the water gets him from one side of the lake to the other. So he feeds them on one side of the lake, then he walks on the water, arrives with his disciples, and now we are on the other side of the lake. And the, the conversation continues, and it continues about bread. This chapter is all about bread. And that the, the flow of the chapter is this. First, Jesus gives bread, then he crosses the lake. And then on the other side, he says, I am bread. And so this is, the, this is the meaning of the giving bread. Now he fills it out. He describes and explains why he did that miracle, not so, so only in order to fill their stomachs, but in order to teach them about him. So Jesus gives bread. Jesus is bread. And then we see at least four different reactions to Jesus' claims about being bread. Some grumbled. Others disputed. Others left. And a few believed. So a long text We'll try to walk through it and see what Jesus says about being bread and then these various responses to his amazing claims. Those who had eaten bread and fish, they sought him, they found him in Capernaum, and they asked him, how did you get here? And then Jesus told them not to focus on material things. You see, those people had the same problem that we did. They were caught up with material things. And of course, they were much close to, uh, to hunger, closer to hunger and starvation than probably any of us have ever been. But Jesus said, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you, you ate and you had your fill. And then he says, don't focus on the material things. I want to take you to another level here. Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. A couple of things here. They were making the same kind of mistake that we often make. 
trying to, to suck life, trying to get some meaning, some significance out of material things. And he says, these material things pass away. They're like sand that goes through your hands. They will not last. So don't build your lives on these material things, but rather look for life which is eternal. Look for life which is real, which is enduring, and you're not going to find it in material things. Now, he says to them something fascinating here. He's talking about working. He says, don't work just for these things, but work for the, the, the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And this is, this is kind of contradictory sounding, isn't it? Because when you work for something, what do you get? You get your wages. You earned it. You get what you deserve, what you've accomplished. And so he says, work for the food that gives eternal life. And then he says, which the Son of Man will give you. Well, which is it? Is it something we work for, or is it something he gives to us? And if you read through this text and underline the word give, you find it all through this text. And he's, he's, he's making a play here. He's making a pivot here. He's saying, yes, work for this, but in the end, this is not something that you can accomplish. This is something that you must receive as a gift. But they're fixated, fixated on works, and so they ask in verse 28, what must we do to be doing the works of God? So they said, you said, Jesus, you talked about works. Well, what are the works that we should do? And so Jesus says to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now, if you're used to reading the letters of Paul, you'll say, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, works are over here and belief is over here. These, these are not the same thing. And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe but this is a sort of ambivalent statement, isn't it? The work of God could mean, and this is what they were asking, the work that God requires. It could mean, okay, they say, well, what work should we do? What works do, does God require of us? Well, Jesus says, the work that God requires of you is to believe in the one whom he sent. That's what you're to do. You're to believe. That's on you. But there's another way of taking this, the work of God. It's the work that God does. It's not the work that God requires of you, but rather the work of God in you. And so this is true in both of these senses. When you think about faith, what is it? It's something that we must do. This is on us. We must believe in the one whom God sent. No one will believe for us. That is our work. That is our activity. But at the same time, it is the work of God in us. God is the one who enables us to perform that work of believing in the one he sent. Now, they, they weren't getting this, and so they said, what sign do you do? Now, isn't that amazing? He had just fed them, and they said, well, in order to believe in you, what, what sign do you do? And, and Jesus could have said, do you not remember yesterday, the sign that I did? But they weren't getting it. And they said, well, because we want you to top Moses. Because in the desert, Moses didn't just multiply things for one day. He gave bread every day. Six days a week we had bread. Can, can you top that? And Jesus clarifies here. And he says, well, it actually wasn't Moses. It was my father who gives you this true bread. And he says, yes, indeed, I can top that. Look at verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You want me to top manna every day for your physical sustenance? Well, I'll do that because God has done that. He has given the true bread. And then he, they said they're missing it. They're like the woman at the well. They're still thinking in material terms. And they say, give us this bread always. And then Jesus drops it and he says, okay, I'm going to tell you specifically about what I'm talking. Verse 35. And this is the first, by the way, this is the first I am statement. You will be coming across a number of I am statements in the Gospel of John. And some of these I am statements are absolute statements. They just stand by themselves. They have no predicate. Jesus just simply says, I am. I am what? He doesn't say, I, I am. And you'll get to those, and Zach will explain those to you. But this is the first I am statement, and it has a predicate. And it's repeated twice here. I am what? The predicate is the bread of life. And you will find other predicates throughout this, this, uh, this letter, and, or this gospel. So keep your eyes open for that. He says, I am the bread. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never 
thirst. But he says, there are two responses here. You've seen me, but you don't believe. Many of you don't believe. But others will believe. And those who believe, will come to, they'll come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. So he's, he's already drawing a line in the sand here. He's saying, some of you don't believe, verse 36, some of you will believe because the Father has given you to me. Here's that verb again, given you to me. And if he gives you to me, you will come and I will not lose you ever, ever. I will raise you up on the last day. And the Jews were expecting a resurrection on the last day. And he said, I will raise you up on the last day. Verse 39, all this, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, there's interesting, many interesting things about this, but in verse 37, he says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me. So the Father gives a people to his Son. And those people come to the Son. There's a huge problem in philosophy and in theology. And it's the question of how we put together determinism of whatever sort and human free will or free agency. Huge thing. You can find philosophers and theologians talking about this to, to, to no end. It's a problem in, in philosophy, it's a problem in theology, but it's never a problem in the Bible. What we find in the Bible is these things are put next to each other, side by side, without any sort of aware, awareness that there is a problem here, which gives me the idea that we are the ones who created this problem. You see, he says, all that the Father has given to me. The Father has predestined, the Father has chosen, the Father has set aside a people, and He gives them to me. They are His gift to me, and they will come. They will come. It's the Father's job to give them to Jesus, and it is their job to come to Jesus, and they come willingly to Jesus. Now, here we find the response in verse 41, or one of the responses. Look at verse 41. What do the Jews do? Are you looking with me? They grumbled. They grumbled. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And he said that a number of times. I came down from heaven. I came down from heaven. Ten times in this chapter, he says, I came down from heaven. I came down from heaven. And they said, no, we know his family. They thought they knew his origins. They said, isn't this, isn't this the, the carpenter, the, the son of Joseph, uh, whose father and mother we know. What, what is this about, I have come down from heaven? And here, Jesus doubles down on this idea. Instead of, instead of making it easier, he doubles down. Verse 43, Jesus answered them, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me drags him, and I will raise him on the last day. So he didn't tone down this idea of, of the Father being in charge of those who come to Jesus and the responsibility of all who hear to go to Jesus. All whom the Father has given me, He draws them to me, and no one can come unless the Father draws them. It's a colorful verb, drags them, which, which indicates some resistance on our part. And so Jesus says, you can't do it unless the Father gives you to do it. And then he goes on in this dispute, and he accentuated the graphic nature of the bread image. And this gets a bit uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for them, and it's uncomfortable reading for us as well. He says in verse 47 very, very clearly, Dropping the metaphor, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever believes has eternal life. And then he goes back to the metaphor. I am the bread of life. And here's the contrast. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, but what happened to them? They died. 
So, so you're looking for this sort of bread? Well, just go, go, go check out your history. What happened to those who ate that bread, that kind of bread you're looking for? They all died. But he says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And here's where it gets kind of uncomfortable. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now that's getting uncomfortable, isn't it? The idea of eating human flesh. That was uncomfortable for them. It's kind of an uncomfortable metaphor for us as well. Maybe we can get the idea of, of in some metaphorical way, of, of, of eating Jesus, receiving Jesus as the bread, and he sustains us and he gives us life. But then he gets very graphic here that we need to eat his flesh. And now the Jews were, were in an uproar, and they began turning on each other, verse 52. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That was a, a, a very unpleasant and disgusting sort of idea. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, and here he doubles down, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he keeps going, 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. 55, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He keeps going, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? It was uncomfortable for them eating flesh and drinking blood. Now, some commentators have said, this, this, to understand this, this has to refer to the Lord's Supper. This just has to refer to the Lord's Supper where we, where we by faith, we, we eat the, the body of the Lord and, and drink His blood. But that is really not the best way to go with this. That's not a, a correct interpretation here. And I'll just give you a couple reasons why. If Jesus were referring to the Lord's Supper, then he was referring to something that his, his original audience could not possibly understand. And he's expecting them to understand what he's saying, and he's expecting them to respond to it. So if we say this is the Lord's Supper then we're saying that Jesus was preaching an opaque sermon to these people that they couldn't possibly have understood. And the other reason is, is that this would introduce a contradiction into Jesus' teaching. Because if this is the Lord's Supper, then Jesus is saying, if you do not take the Lord's Supper, you will not have life. And the one thing necessary for you is to take the Lord's Supper to have eternal life. Now, there are those in the history of the church that believe that, but if that were what Jesus were, were saying, then he would be introducing a, a contradiction, a bald contradiction here, because he already told us the one thing necessary, didn't he? In verse 47, if you believe, you have eternal life. And if he were now introducing the one thing necessary as the Lord's Supper, he would be introducing two things and introducing a contradiction between these two. Those are just two reasons why this cannot be referring to the Lord's Supper. The true explanation is this, and it's, it's simple, and that is that eating and drinking are images of believing. Images of believing because believing, what does it do? It receives Jesus deeply into our lives. Verse 56, whoever feeds on my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. We use similar language all the time without thinking about it. We use language about eating to refer to believing, grasping, receiving. We devour a book. We drink in a concert. We swallow a story. We ruminate on ideas. We chew over a matter. Or if we find somebody particularly adorable, we say, I could just eat you up. We use this sort of language. And it has to do with thinking, accepting, believing, receiving. And that's what this is all about here. Well, to follow this image, Many of Jesus' followers found Jesus' teaching too hard to what? 
swallow. He was saying, this is what you need to swallow, and they found it too hard to swallow. And so we find his disciples in the last verses here, verses 60 to 71, we find how the disciples responded. And by the way, through the Gospel of John, you will find this this ambivalence about believing and about disciples. Because sometimes it'll say they believed, and then at the end of the chapter, they want to stone him. So did they believe or not? And it says that they're his disciples, they were his followers, and now we're going to find out what some of those followers did or didn't do. And this is the challenge of the Gospel of John. Later on, you'll find out the purpose of the Gospel of John, but you can already intuit it. It's so that we might believe in Jesus. That's the purpose. But the question is, do you or not? And that's the question that's brought to us in a very strong way at the end here, where we find the disciples responding to Jesus' difficult words. Many of the disciples heard it. Verse 60, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And it's not clear which of the sayings they were finding hard because there were a number of hard sayings in this text, weren't there? A number of hard sayings here. The flesh doesn't profit anything. You need the Spirit. You can't come to me unless the Father draws you. I will raise you up on the last day. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one who came down from heaven. If a man eats of my flesh, drinks of my blood, he will have eternal life. The one who believes in me will have eternal life. There are a number of hard sayings in this text. And it's not clear over which they were stumbling, but they found these these sayings to be difficult. And Jesus knew that they were grumbling. Verse 61, Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling, his disciples, they're called here, were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? And now we're going to think that, well, Jesus is now going to make it easier, right? He's going to make a statement that's easier to accept. You take offense at this? Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, well, maybe it won't be so offensive if I say it this way. That's not what he does. He doubles down again. Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? He's already said, I've come down, I've come down, I've come down. The Father sent me, and I'm going to ascend to where I was before. He doesn't take away the offense here. If anything, he raises it. Then it says, Jesus said, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you disciples, some of you disciples who do not believe. And here again, we have that, that question of God's sovereignty here in parenthesis, parenthesis here, verse 64. For Jesus knew from the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning. That's how John starts. In the beginning. From before the foundations of the world, Jesus knew from the beginning who were those who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. So he doesn't make this any easier. He says it again. You can't come on your own, but you must come. The Father gives a people to me, and that people comes, and I will not lose them. I will raise them up on the last day. So come is the invitation. After this, verse 66, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. The sayings were just too hard. They they couldn't swallow them. And so they wanted no more to do with them. They wanted no more to do with Jesus. They had been learners for a little while. They had been followers for a little while. They had been disciples for a little while. But just got too hard, too difficult. Some of the things they just could not accept, and they no longer walked with him. And so Jesus turned to the 12, verse 67, and he asked them a question, and that question is a good question for all of us. What about you? You heard the same hard sayings. What about you? What what are you going to do? 
Do you want to go away as well? Peter, James, John, Thomas, Bartholomew. Do, do you want to leave too? And Peter, you got to love Peter. He just blurts things out. And sometimes he's way off. And he says the most inappropriate things. And then other times Peter just nails it. He gets right to the core, right to the heart of the matter. And he says to Jesus, Lord, to whom should we go? To whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. When Jesus says, do you want to go away as well? Peter, in essence, says, exactly where would we go? What, what other viable options are there out there for us? Where would we go? Jesus, you are the ones. You are the one who has the words of eternal life. And, and here, Peter did not have an exhaustive knowledge of all the religions and all the philosophies that existed up to that point in the world or that would ever exist. But what he said, what he said was objectively speaking true. There is no one else who has words like Jesus' words. And the futile attempts to compare Jesus to other philosophies and religions are, are destined to fail because Jesus is unique. There is no one else who speaks this way. There is no one else who offers what Jesus offers. And Peter tabulates very quickly and says, Jesus, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And Peter had heard the same difficult words. He'd heard the same hard sayings. But he said, even in spite of those hard sayings, some of those things that are hard to swallow, and it was hard for Peter to swallow that Jesus was going to go to the cross and die and be raised from the dead on the third day. That, that was hard for Peter to swallow. He didn't want any of that at first. But he said, where else would we go? What other options are out there? And so we come to the end of this. We've seen grumbling. We've seen disputing. We've seen leaving. And now we see believing, believing in Jesus. And Jesus said, even your believing is because I chose you. Did I not choose you? I chose you. And that's why you believe. This is actually one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I love Peter's statement because I read the Bible constantly. I'm a pastor, became a Christian as a high school student and a pastor in my mid-20s. And I've dedicated my life to reading the Bible and teaching it to others. But sometimes I awake at 2 or 3 in the morning, panic-stricken, wondering what life is all about, wondering what's real, and thinking about some of the difficult things about Christianity, and, and thinking about some of the hard sayings and some of the things in the Bible that are hard to swallow. And I hear Jesus asking me, Larry, do you want to go somewhere else? Do you, do you want to leave too? And in my mind, I quickly try to go over the different options. And I ask myself, and I answer to Jesus, where would I go? What else is there? You have the words of eternal life. So, now it's in our lap. That's what this text does to us. You've heard Jesus Jesus' declaration, I'm the bread of life. He who believes in me will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And he says to us, so what are you going to do? Let's pray. Our God, we read some hard sayings in this text. We read harder ones in other parts of the Bible, but we see in Jesus the one who has the words of eternal life. And we know that we cannot believe that unless the Father draws us to Jesus. And so I pray today that those who are hearing this good news preached here or in any other place, that you would draw us to Jesus, that we might believe and that we might have eternal life. And oh God, when our faith is faltering, when we're, we're struggling 
to, to swallow, to grasp, to understand, to accept hard things in Your Word, I pray, O oh God, that You would point us once again to Jesus, the only one who has the words of eternal life. Amen.